This is Adelard. He's 43 years old, lives in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. He has a nice life. Here's the house that he built. He's very proud of that. Here's his family and the corn that he grows. But his life is very fragile. Over the last two decades, two wars have killed over five million people in the Congo. That's the deadliest conflicts since World War II. First, you've heard about it? Join most of the world. But what happens there matters, and let me tell you why. This is a photo that Adelard took just last month driving around his hometown. Those civilians, they're at risk from soldiers, government soldiers, rebel forces, foreign and domestic. Adelard explains that we don't have enough to eat. The soldiers do what they want. They harass, they steal, they shoot people every day. He asks, who can we rely on? His existence is on the edge. Now, why should we care about Adelard? Simply put, because we cannot stay safe and prosperous without the help of the developing world. Don't believe me? Let me show you how the billions in the developing world are directly linked to our threats and opportunities. Take out those cell phones that Al made you turn off a minute ago. <laughs> Take a look at it. See that cobalt? Every electronic that you brought in here today with you has cobalt in it. And 50% of the world's cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. That war I was just telling you about, it gets much worse, and you're not going to have that cobalt or that cell phone. So what happens in the Congo matters. The Congo has a lot more than just cobalt. It has tin, copper, diamonds, gold, $24 trillion worth of riches just below the surface. And yet the people there, like Adelard, cannot enjoy those riches because there is no rule of law in the Congo. Criminals can and do operate there with impunity. They launder money, traffic in human slaves. Refugees flee out of the country and into neighboring countries, and even here to the United States. The notorious war criminal Joseph Kony, the one who uses child soldiers, uses the Congo as a safe haven. Rebels there support terrorists, including Al-Shabaab that blew up that mall in Kenya just last month, killing 70 people. So what happens in the Congo can directly affect us. And never forget that Osama bin Laden used two failed states, Sudan and Afghanistan, when planning 9-11. So what happens here matters. States like the Congo, failed states, can directly affect our prosperity and security. Now, do you feel safe today? Do you feel prosperous? I don't. We've just come out of a recession, jobless recovery, stagnation. In the last year, in the last recession, we lost $14 trillion of economic activity. That's a year's worth of economic activity. The bottom 70% of workers saw their wages decline. So I don't feel prosperous, and I don't feel safe. We are still under the threat of terrorism, cyber warfare, those pirates in Somalia. And never forget Al-Qaeda or those bombers from Chechnya. America is in their crosshairs. Now pick any threat that you care about, infectious diseases, environmental degradation, turmoil in the Middle East or Pakistan, or perhaps you care about the threat to right whales. 
Whatever it is, we cannot solve it on our own. Now, in times of economic uncertainty, <laughs> I recognize that sometimes the world seems like a chaotic mess, and we're tired of being called upon to be the world's policemen. When times are tough, we want to withdraw from the world, put up our barriers, and put our head in the sand. And Lord knows, listening to the talk radio host or those <laughs> political know-nothings blather on about global social welfare, sometimes it almost sounds like a good plan. does sound like a good plan, I guess, huh? <laughs> but we withdraw from the world at our peril. In today's world, our solutions depend on the actions of the rest of the world. Just look at the numbers. There are 300 million Americans, but there are 7 billion people on this planet. And that number is going to 9 billion by the middle of, the next, of this century. And that growth in $2, billion, in $2 billion is not here in the United States. We simply cannot go it alone. But when we act globally, think globally, we prosper. 40% of the Fortune 500 companies today were founded by immigrants or one of their children. Steve Jobs' father came from Syria. And this year, Apple bested Coca-Cola as the best global brand. 14% of our GDP comes from exports. Imagine how much more prosperous we could be if we sold more to those billions across the globe. And we can, if we just help them first to prosper. I want to start a very different conversation, one in which the world, north, south, east, and west, understand that we all have the same struggles and need to work together. I call it the New Global Compact. And it can revolutionize the 21st century and make us more prosperous and more secure. What if we all understood that we live on the same planet and we all want the same thing, security and prosperity, and that we can't have either if the others don't? Sound like common sense, doesn't it? Have you ever noticed that common sense is very rare? <laughs> Think about it. The billions in the developing world, they're not in Al-Qaeda's crosshairs. They don't worry about cybersecurity. What they worry about is having enough to eat, clean water to drink, staying out of the crosshairs of deadly conflict. But they too want prosperity. They want a nice home, a good job, and a decent life for their kids. And so do we. We want a nice home, a good job, and a decent and better life for our children. And what's it going to take to get there? I define the new global compact as the haves and have nots address each other's challenges and we both become more prosperous and more secure. Sound fanciful? It's not. But what's it going to take to get the world to act on this new global compact? U.S. visionary leadership. No one else can drive such a consensus. Now, there are those who think we're not exceptional. 
But we remain the only superpower, and when we fail to act, the world falters. But when we lead, things happen. <laughs> now, writing the superpower ship of the United States is not easy, much less changing the behavior of the rest of the world. And the US president does not have superpowers. And the conditions have to be right. But there's in progress in three key areas that make the time right for us to act on the global compact. First, those crises of the auto, the housing, and the financial crisis, they're largely on the right track. While we still got some work to do, that makes it possible, frees up our president to act. Second, the rising middle powers are emerging and asymmetries are receding. That's a game changer that makes it possible for this new global compact to come to fruition. Now first we have to make some institutional changes. If you've noticed, we're still in the time of economic uncertainty. We still face stagnant recoveries. We aren't past the foreclosures. Europe is still mired in crises. The combination of austerity programs and economic growth is not enough. Even a child in Ireland understands that we've not done enough to help the poorer debtor nations of Europe. And it's time that we ended the scenario where banks are too big to fail. We need common sense reforms like getting banks out of debt swaps and running hedge funds and private equity enterprises. These reforms are essential. And next, those rising powers, we need to give them a seat at the global decision-making tables. That means giving them more shares and chairs at the IMF and more leadership roles at the World Bank and a permanent seat at the UN Security Council. And with those new leadership seats come a responsibility to act with us on implementing the new global compact. And if we take these international institutional changes, it'll set the stage for the new global compact to come to fruition. The solutions are there for the taking. What is lacking is political will, a sense of urgency, and an understanding that we're all in this together. Those who oppose this course of action call it whimsical social work. It is anything but. This is not social work. It is a critical investment in our own security and prosperity. And if we fail to act and implement the new global compact, our future will be defined by others to our peril. Now, I understand this is not easy. When I was at the White House, I understand how hard it is to get through that inbox and focus on the big picture of the day. And to me, this is very personal. I was at the White House while the Rwandan genocide occurred, killing 800,000 people. Shortly after that, I went to Rwanda, and I'll never forget walking through a grassy field and stepping over a bone, only to realize it was a human femur bone. Walking into a church and seeing bodies strewn across the floor, having been hacked to death by machetes, including that of a little girl still in her Sunday best. So we must act. It's time the United States take up the mantle of the new global compact, start a new conversation, and lay the foundation 
for it to emerge. We can do this. If we can build the political will, the solutions are there for the taking. Let me explain. There are billions in the world just like Adelard in the Congo. And there are billions more who have it much worse, who struggle on the bare minimum trying to find enough to eat and stay out of those crosshairs of deadly conflict. They see their children die from dirty water, malaria, HIV, AIDS. One in seven does not have enough to eat. One in 10 can't find clean water. Three million die of it. But if we help them with those problems, they can help us with ours. So I said a minute ago that the solutions were there for the taking. What are they? We know what we need to do. We need to end extreme poverty. The UN has a plan to do just that. We need to break down trade barriers so the world's farmers don't live in poverty. And we need to get ahead of the global water and climate crises and help the developing world do so too. And we need to build up institutions and infrastructure to sustain this progress. And if we do this, what do we get in return? They'll help us fight terrorism, address the crisis of cyber threats, open their, good, their markets to our goods, and play by the rules. So you see, if we both act on a new global compact, we can achieve global prosperity and security. So that brings me back to Adelard in the Congo. If we help end that war in the Congo, they'll help rid the country of terrorists and criminals who threaten us. And we can help them develop that $24 trillion of riches just beneath the earth. And yes, you can have the cell phone you want. What Adelard really wants to do is move from the tax office and trade in those minerals. He's tried to trade in copper and tin, but he can't compete with the rebels who steal the country's wealth. But if we act and help him move from the tax office to the commodity trading floor, we will both be more secure and prosperous. Does all this sound impossible, fanciful? Maybe so today, but if we think differently, act boldly, and demand action, we can truly change the world. Thank you.